Happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath. I hope everyone has had a wonderful week. It's been a wonderful and blessed week for me. I am so glad to be back before you guys today. And let me switch over to my comment screen here now so I'll be able to see everything. Once we get going again, I hope you've had a wonderful week. Welcome to the broadcast. If you um, feel so inclined to share this out, please do so because today's topic, you know, all of the topics are important, but today's topic, especially at this time in Earth's history is ever, ever so important to get this message out and to get it out in a way to where it's understood. So happy Sabbath, commit thy way unto the Lord trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. Isn't he a God of his word and his promises and he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noon day, right? One of my favorites, Psalms 37 verse five and six, right? First, we want to do things accordingly. Hey, Sister Regina, Glad to see you, Sister Sam. See you in the building. Um, I can see people over on Facebook there, but you know, it doesn't give me the names as everybody's coming in. So, those of you that are on Facebook, welcome to the broadcast as well. And you know, just to do things in an orderly fashion here. As we always do, let's just go ahead and start out with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you with confidence, not based on ourselves, Lord, but based on your love and your word. Father, let your praises be in our hearts and on our lips today. As we open our Bibles today and begin to study your word, we pray that we would be able to hear your voice and hear it clearly. We ask that your Holy Spirit will be at work, opening our ears and our hearts to receive your word, Lord, and may we be transformed into your life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right, let's not delay this today, right? Again, as I always say, an important topic and one that's going to take a little maybe a little bit of time to get through. Um, as always, you know, if you're trying to take notes as we go through this, the replay, and again, thank you replay viewers for those that are you are, those of you that are watching this on the replay, or you be, may be watching it later on down the road over on one of the other social media outlets. But let me just thank you for taking the time to come back and um, watch the replay, right? But for those of you that are live, if you're trying to scribble and take notes, don't worry because I leave my replays up. You're always able to come back and sit down with you, you know, in your own study time and go back and be able to take the notes or, you know, screenshots, however you want to do it. But just rest assured, it is not going to disappear. It will be up for you to use, whether it's here on Facebook, Periscope, or over on the YouTube channel, right? So today's topic, the R&B of God's judgment and the great 2300 day prophecy. Some of you may have heard this before, and, you know, it may not be anything new, but some of you, you know, that will be in the listening audience, you know, now and on the replay, this may be new to you, you know, so just take your time, open your minds, open your hearts, you know, and just let the Lord speak to you. Because at this time in Earth's history, Satan is aware that we're living in a special time in Earth's history. Believe me, he is well aware. And at this time, the, the, there's one thing that we can be doing, the great greatest thing that we can be doing. You know, can anybody tell me what that is at this time before we get started? One of the greatest things that each and every one of us can be doing and definitely should be doing. It's just one one little simple thing, right? One simple thing. And it doesn't even take a whole lot of thought process to go through one simple thing that we all should be partaking in. Praying, most definitely, most definitely praying. But the, the greatest thing that we can and should be doing right now, we must know God we must begin to form a relationship with him, right? And let me switch myself down because this is not about me. Father, I ask that you hide me behind the cross because it is not about me. It is about your message. So let me make the me smaller and put me at the back. Lord, lessen me and greaten you that you may be glorified. Amen. We must get to know God, right? We've got to get to know him. This is a work that must take place in each and every one of us. We have to know him personally. It's not enough for us to say, I, we know him as a family, right? Me, my brother, my sister, my cousin, you know, we all worship him as a family because God does not know 
that we are his by religious denomination or church affiliation. That's just fact. That's it's not right. God knows us that are his because we have a personal relationship and a friendship with him, right? And there's a three-step plan to getting to know God. You know, and, and you maybe say a three-step plan. I just thought I'd sit down with my it's a three-step plan, right? And so let's look at it here. Let me switch over. Thy way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary. Thy way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary. You've seen that scripture before. You've probably heard it over and over and saying, Thy way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary. Well, think about it. How many places are there within the sanctuary, right? I didn't say items, I said places. Three places within the sanctuary, right? And this is how we know that there's a three-step plan because there's three different places in the sanctuary. You have the outer court, the holy place, right? And the most holy place. And in those three steps, we found that there's three things that we can do in the process of getting to know God. So what's the first thing that we must understand, right? And you may be saying at this point, well, Torah, I don't understand what this has to do with the R&B, the real and biblical of God's judgment in the great 2300 day prophecy. Well, Moses tells us in Numbers 23 and 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? So, in order to know 100%, 100.99999% that God is not a man, that he should lie, you have to get to know him, right? And know that he keeps his word and he keeps his promises. He says what he means and he means what he says. And once you get to that point, once you resolve that in you and step put, put you behind, put your pride aside and say, I know that 100% he is not a God, that he should lie and will lie, right? Once you know that and can, you, and you fully understand, right? You'll be able to fully understand and wrap your head, for those of you that haven't heard this before, around this message, right? Around the context of today's lesson, right? So the R&B of God's judgment and the great 2300-day prophecy, you'll know he means what he says as we go through this teaching, right? So now, with that being said, the first thing that we must understand about the steps, the three steps of getting to know God, we must know and understand the time, right? So the second thing, we must know what to do, right? And all of this, you may be saying, well, wait a minute, ain't none of this in the Bible nowhere, right? Of course it is, because we keep it R&B around here, right? We keep it real and biblical. If it ain't in the Bible, we're not putting it up. We go line by line, precept upon precept, straight from the word of God. We don't add to it and we don't take away from it, right? So let's look at it. We have to know and understand the time. First Chronicles 12 and verse 32. What about knowing what to do, right? Where does the Bible, where does the Bible, Torah, where does it say that I need to know what to do as part of the three steps in getting to know God? Well, it's in the same place. First Chronicles 12, verse 32, right? We see it right there. So what is the third step once we know what to do, right? right? We can become God's friend. We can become God's friend. And that's under the most holy place, right? No matter what we do, we can become God's friend, right? No, we know that's not right, right? The Bible says we can become his friend if we do whatever Jesus says, right? Well, so the devil's plan of stopping us from becoming God's friend is to cause us not to know what to do, right? And the only way to stop us from knowing, uh, to stop us from knowing what to do is to pre prevent us from understanding what? The time the urgency, the time right now. So Satan's plan is to confuse us. And if we just look around, we see that there's a lot of confusion on this earth right now. There's a lot of confusion going on in this world, a lot of unnecessary hustle and bustle. We got a whole lot of cooks putting stuff into the stew that should not be there. And it's making it a little bit bitter to the stomach, right? Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> let me say, it's not love 
It is not love to sit and be quiet when there's a crisis coming, right? And we know that Satan is ever so busy to sit and be quiet with the message that's cowardice, right? It takes someone who is going to give the trumpet a certain sound before the crisis start, right? To tell you, right? Hey, I'm here to tell you the crisis is already here, right? Must we see things that were foretold clearly in scripture scripture come to pass before we believe what God says, right? Do we have to continue to see things falling apart, things unfolding before we take him at his word and believe what he says, right? Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, the great day of the Lord is near and at hand, even at the doors, right? So I'm not going to sit and have judgment fall upon my head when the books are open for not sounding the trumpet or sit and wait until God's judgment falls upon the transgressors before telling you how to avoid it, right? And we all need to be like Esther. She did several important things, right? Those of us who know the truth, those of us that are sitting on it, but we're afraid to speak out, we're afraid to say, hey, that wait a minute, you might want to reconsider that, right? We're sitting around with gorilla glue mouth, you know. We got uh, we've taken crazy glue and glued our lips shut, you know. We see people doing something like, mm -mm, I can't say none, I don't want them to think I'm crazy, I don't want to stand out. You got gorilla glue mouth, right? And you're afraid to open your mouth and speak up, and that's what the devil wants you to do, right? He wants you to sit quiet, the devil wants you to sit back quiet and allow people to destroy their distinctive identity. He wants God's people to continue destroying their identity and not knowing whose they are, right? And from whence they come, right? They want to, the devil clearly wants to destroy a person. And if you want to destroy somebody, you destroy their identity, you take away who they are, and it's a wrap. That is all you have to do. And Satan is aware of that, right? So before the crisis, Esther had to, one, realize and recognize her distinctive identity, right? Second, she had to brace uh, embrace that distinctive distinctive identity. You know, when Mordecai came to her and said, look, uh, Esther, you used to be Hadassah back in the day. And let me explain things to you. This is what you need to do. She had to reconcile with herself and embrace that distinctive identity. And third, she had to manifest and open up and reveal that distinctive identity to the entire world, right? So as a Bible believing, full 10, commandment keeping, full 10, commandment keeping, truth knowing Christian, you're going to have to start doing the same thing, right? You cannot sit back idle and quiet. Go get whatever you need to unseal your mouth so you are able to speak this word and sound the trumpet with a certain sound. Amen? So now, with that being said, let's begin this study because we but a little time, like I said, even at the doors, he comes to soon knock, right? We but a little time in earth's history, right? Earth's billions right now of people are on trial. So the question is, what of your future? What of it? You know, at this time, right? Hadassah became Queen Esther, a new character, right? You have to reveal that and not be afraid to step into who you are and to speak out with the truth that God has put on your heart and to let people know. Because we know here in the biblications, it clearly tells us that's on you if you sit back and let it fall and not say anything. So, hey, I'm just saying, I, I got enough to be held accountable for on my own. So, so not telling you the truth of the word, mm -mm. I'm not taking that one. I'm not going out like that. Mm -mm. Ain't gonna happen, not on this watch, right? So at this time in earth's history, it is most important to understand the facts about God's book of life, right? Currently, there are nations, races, and religions who are sitting at a crossroads, not sure which direction to go. Like I said, it's a lot of cooks putting a whole lot of different ingredients in the stew that should not be there and it's making it real sour and real, uh, real bitter, right? So what's next, right? You are now facing judgment. Picture this. You are facing judgment before the Supreme Court of the universe. Therefore, I present you today with a summons to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This summons is to be presented to each one sitting here today before me under the sound of my voice. And the all important question is, are you 
ready, right? In 2 Corinthians 5.10, we read, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. It doesn't say some have to appear. It doesn't say a few have to appear. It clearly says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Follow me now. Like I said, a lot of you going to be seeing something and saying, well, wait a minute. I've never seen it like this before. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry the truth was held back, but I'm here today to open the floodgates of truth before your ears, before your eyes. And all you have to do is follow with me line upon line, precept upon precept, and allow the word of God to penetrate through your heart and to open your mind and say, my gosh, I've been being deceived, but shall I no longer, right? That everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that, he had done whether it be good good or bad. It makes no difference who you are. It makes no difference what your profession is. It makes no difference where you live, how big your house is, how many Beamers, Bentleys, and Boomers you have parked out front. It makes no difference. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, right? We can hide things from men, but there's not a single thing that we can hide from God. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 14 tells us, for God will bring every work, not some works, not a few works, not a little bit of this, a little bit of that, right? It says, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil, right? God has a complete record of our lives and it is all to be reviewed in the judgment. And there's a reason for that, right? He knows the innermost secrets of our minds and he looks into the deep recesses of our heart, right? I can lie to Regina. I can lie to Sam. I can sit on here and tell y'all all kinds of lies, but God knows the truth of my heart. He knows those secret things. So there's no point in sitting there going through that, right? Why create more things that we have to repent for that are already necessary than the human things that already just pop up within our flesh, right? Don't go creating all that extra stuff. Like, look here, you may have heard the story of the woman who had plotted to get insurance, right? For her invalid husband. She And what she did was she took a long, narrow, thin nail, right? And she drove it into his brain. She neatly wiped it away, wiped away the blood, cleaned it up, combed his hair neatly over it just in place, right? The family doctor wasn't suspecting anything. Who would suspect this little innocent lady, right? So he pronounced, so the doctor pronounces the husband dead from natural causes, right? He's an invalid. He was sick. Why would he think anything of it? Now, years later, it was necessary for the operators of that cemetery for some reason, we know what reason, God always has a reason for everything, to dig up the remains of some of the deceased within that cemetery, right? And it just so happened that this woman's grave, uh, a woman's husband, his grave was one of the ones that needed to be opened. And when they dug up the body and they started reviewing and going through the required process, they found the nail piercing in his skull, right? And the authorities, once they were informed of this, of course, they went to the woman and started to question her. And what did she say? She said, oh, Lord, God done found me out at last. Lord, Lord, God done found me. Well, guess what? God knew about the crime all the time. Nothing can be hidden from God. And I remember my grandmother used to always say to me while we were growing up, Tor, what's done in the dark will always come to the light. So remember what you're doing. She always said at least once or twice a day, if not more, Tor, what's done in the dark will always come to the light. And I tell you, that is so true. It may be something that you've done and you've completely forgotten about it. Guarantee you the sweet Lord of mercy and grace is going to send somebody along to be like, you remember that time we went out in high school and we robbed this, this, this? And you're like, oh my Lord, I forgot all about that. You know, all these different things. So God knows nothing can be hidden from God, right? Those things that we 
think that we've hidden from the Lord will be revealed in judgment. It will be a bitter experience when sins are being exposed. Just imagine just standing there and playing stuff back. Stuff that when we sit sometimes in silence and prayer and reflection with the Lord and he brings it and you say, Lord, just bring back to my members so I can repent for that. And some of the things that come back and you're like, oh Lord, I repent for that. Those are things you don't want broadcast to the world, right? Our whole lives will be presented before us in a panoramic view. Then the world's pleasures, riches, honors, they might not seem so important at that time, right? And in contrast, how much easier and better is it to confess our sins to the Lord now during this time of his day of mercy, his days, his minutes, his hours of mercy, and as opposed to when the judgment comes, right? Our sins will be covered with the blood of Jesus and forever blotted out. Go ahead and repent for them now, right? So they're never to be revealed. As the scripture tells us, allow them to be thrown down into the deep abyss of the sea, right? Every unkindness, every thoughtless act, every cruel word and idle word will be presented. And we just say stuff so aloof now. We sit behind these keyboards as keyboard gangsters and keyboard activists just saying vile and crazy and mean things to people. You just scrolling through and you see a picture of somebody and because your spirit thinks you behind a screen, it's okay to sit there and say vile things to that person. The Lord will remember that. Every cruel word, every idle word will be presented. I'm here to tell you today, brothers and sisters, right? Startling as it may seem, the investigative judgment is going on at at this present time, right now, in heaven, right? How do I know? In Revelation chapter 14, there are three angels who have special messages for the inhabitants of planet Earth, this dark planet, right? Who will be living in the last days just before Jesus returns. These angels represent messages of warnings, right? That are to be proclaimed around the world. And as I said, Prior, we have a lot of people that know this should be sounding the alarm, but because you don't want to look different, you don't want to stand out, you want to blend in. You say, I'm just going to keep it to myself. How selfish is that? That is just not right, right? Blot out my transgressions, iniquity, and sin. Lord, cry out constantly, Lord, help us, right? The third angel's warning deals with the mark of the beast. And you're like, oh, here she go with that. I heard that before. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, simmer down, idle down. The second angel's warning with the fall of Babylon. And the first angel has a special judgment hour message, right? Refuse to give the warning. Watchman will answer. It says it right there in the biblication. All you got to do is check. The Bible tells us in Revelations 14 and 6, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. The people of God are to fulfill the prophecy of Jesus found in Matthew 24 and 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come as it is to be one of the signs of the last days, right? And in addition, they will be proclaiming this special warning message concerning the judgment. The next verse of Revelations 14, 7 reveals this great fact, saying with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him, right? That's part of the good news, Regina. It is to me. Every time I look, I'm like, this is good news. This is nothing to sit back in woe and sorrow. And you have a lot of people that are afraid to stand in the pulpit and open up revelation because they don't understand it. They, they, they use it to invoke fear in people. That is not what revelation about. If you go to the very beginning of it, it even starts out because every from Genesis to revelations, you should be able to find Jesus through every single book. And if you open your biblication and look at it, verse one of Revela uh, Revelation one, chapter one, 
chapter one, verse one, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's starting out telling you right there. This is the good news. Why? Because he's right here. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's telling you what's to come and what's going to happen, right? But people are so afraid to touch the book, right? Fear God equals translated as reverently obey. People are afraid of the book. Pastors, ministers, evangelists, they're like, "Mm -mm, I'm not touching that. But then you have the ones that use it to condemn everybody under the sun and preach fire and brimstone. And you're going to sit there and burn, you know, by unmerciful God in hell, you know, to your backbone being. That's not how any of this works. That's not what it's any, that's a whole nother scope. Let me go on. That made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of the waters, right? God's true people of the last days will be, be will be proclaiming a judgment hour message. So in other words, God's great judgment will be in progress when this special warning message is being proclaimed to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Brothers and sisters, I sit before you today to tell you that's right now. That's not 10 years from now. That's not 20 years from now. That is right now. Let me tell you, there are three phases of every trial. First, you have the investigation, right? Which is what? The review of the facts. Second, you have the judicative or making the decision guilty or not guilty, right? Third, you had the executive, which either gives you a pardon or a punishment. One of the two P's, pardon or punishment, right? So it is with God's great judgment that there will be an investigative phase, adjudicative phase, and an executive phase of his judgment of sinners, right? So it is with that, right? Again, you got that investigative phase, adjudicative phase, and the executive phase. Look at it there, clearly laid out. Remember, when Jesus returns, the Bible says he is coming to execute judgment upon the earth. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come, right? We look at it here. He is coming to execute judgment upon the earth. That is to give the rewards of salvation or damnation to saints and sinners, not eternal fire sitting there burning and rotting in hell. No, no, no. People need to stop that crazy stuff. Revelations 22, 12. And behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to to his and or her work, right? Right there, revelation to my reward is with me. Therefore, the investigative and the judicial phases of God's great judgment will have already occurred before he returns. You're not going to sit and go out and say, you know what, let me just start handing a bunch of people rewards, right? But you haven't looked to see if they deserve the reward. Come on, Lord have mercy. Mm. So it will already have been determined who will be lost and who will be saved, right? The Bible says he comes to reward every man according to his work, whether they be good or bad, right? Eternal punishment is not biblical. It just is not. And it clicks. I can't get sidetracked because I just want to go off almost into that one, but I got to stay here, right? I'm going to come back and do that one at another time because this whole thing about people up in hell burning right now, waiting on the judgment day to come, mm-mm. I don't even know what that's that kind of stuff. Came. That is not the case. That is, mm-mm. it's just not. Right now, God is pleading with the human race to accept the cross of Jesus Christ, which is their only, which is my only, which is your only hope for freedom in eternal life, right? Right now, God's investigative judgment is in progress right now. Remember, in the hour of God's judgment, either our sins will be blotted out of his book of records by the blood of Jesus 
or we will forever lose our place with the people of God. That's all to it. There will be no future probation in which to prepare for eternity. Once the door is closed, it is closed not to reopen. The same way when he took his mighty powerful hand and he slowly closed that huge door on the ark, no matter how hard they clawed on the outside, once that rain started to fall, once that crazy fanatic Noah stopped preaching and him and his family went inside the ark, right? Once, uh, uh, you remember that? And they were like, rain? Ain't going to be no rain. But once it started to rain and that door was closed, once it was shut, they clawed at it. They pulled at it. I'm quite sure some of them animals, them bulls, they tried to ram it, you know? The people probably looking at it, ram it thing. Come on. But it didn't open. Once the door is closed, brothers and sisters, it is closed. So since it says, I come with a quickness, basically to translate it into modern day terms, he coming with the quickness. And we don't know when that is, right? Judgment was done, rewards issued. He gave his life. What more could he give, right? When you look at it right now, that is in progress. The judgment is in progress, right? It is now that we must accept Jesus as our savior. John describes them. Look at the scene John gives us here, Revelation 20 and 11. And I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it. Now, for those of you that like to go and say that, let me, let me just go back. Let me just keep it real and biblical here. Some of you, all you may have heard was the word white and you too. Oh, there you go with that white man. I didn't say it, the scripture does not say, and I saw a great white man sitting on a great white throne. That is not what he says. Whatever color you need him to be in your mind, you go ahead and you deal with that right now. Deal with that in your personal time as you're getting to know God, right? But the scripture clearly says, and I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no place found, no place for them, right? That's a solemn scene. Sad will be the retrospect in that day when men stand to face, right? Stand face to face with eternity. When you're facing it, there's nowhere else to turn. Then when it's too late, the sinner will then see righteousness, right? It's like when they tell you, hey, it's a category 10, Category eight, category seven, because they getting worse and worse when they're telling you start boarding up, start leave. But people say, mm -mm, I'm staying here with my stuff. I don't want I don't want nobody coming in and steal my TV. But then when the waters start rushing in, when the houses start filling up, then people start crying out. Oh, Lord, mercy. Oh, Lord, I should have left. I should have left. Then when it is too late. The sinner will see that the righteousness that they despise are treated indifferently, made silly little means about is the only real thing that was of value right now at this time in earth's history, right? John then tells us how this investigative judgment is conducted. Revelations 20 and 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were what? Opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their words. Good afternoon, Sister Missy Bella. Good afternoon. Judged according to their works. Now, if the dead are already enjoying the bliss of heaven, and a friend of mine said, and every time I think about it, I can't help but laugh. She said, you know, is it going to be any room left for us? Because heaven got to be real full right now. If everybody that has passed on is already in heaven, is there any room left? Is that right? So if the dead are already enjoying the bliss of heaven, are writhing in the flames of an everlasting hell, then what's the need of a judgment? Remembering when we started out, he is not a God that he should lie. Remember, right? So what would be the need of a future judgment? No, 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 dear friends. The dead are not being punished now, but will receive their reward or punishment in the great day of final reward, award when Jesus comes to execute the judgment. Plain and simple. We just followed it line by line in the scripture. The Bible makes it very plain that all the dead 
every man, woman, and child will be judged. For it says, Revelations 20, 13, 15, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And Lord knows, Lord knows, there's a lot of dead across that sea from one continent coming to another continent. Just think of all those people, all of the stuff that we think about that brings up a rage inside of us. But if we just think on that last day when he said, vengeance is mine, said the Lord, that gives me such a great peace that I don't have to go out and be nasty and angry to my fellow man, to my brother, no matter how vile they are, 70 times seven. Remember what it says. And it's a hard thing to do. And I don't sit before you telling you to do anything that I don't practice myself. I don't tell you to do anything that's not hard for me to swallow and be like, but God, Oh, but God, but God, because it's a hard thing to do, right? But if you think when people start talking about that 144,000 number, that could be real slim pickings right there because following these things, it's a hard one. I mean, every step of the way, you have to be conscious. And if you don't let God guide, you're going to get off track somewhere. Let's get back on track. And the sea gave up the dead, which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead, which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their worth. See it right there. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So the record books in heaven in which the names and deeds of all men are registered, of all people are registered, are to determine the decisions in God's supreme court of the universe. Dear friends, brothers and sisters, family, friends, countrymen, loved ones, the great eternal judgment of the universe has been called and is meeting at this very moment. You remember it was a meeting that started this whole thing right now that we're sitting in the middle of this whole sin war. Remember it was a meeting that took place and Lucifer was upset because he was not invited to that meeting. So what happened? He said, hmm, you don't want to let me come to the meeting? You don't want to let me be like him, even though he was exalted and treated just as high on that same level. That was not enough. He said, mm -mm. that meeting right there, because Lucifer was not able to go to that meeting, has us in this predicamentation that we in right now, this predicament, mm -hmm. this predicamentation. That's a whole new word. Add that one to your dictionary, right? Right now. This is a very important meeting that's taking place, investigating the records of our lives. Romans 2, verse 3. And thinkest thou this, O man, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? You think because you got more degrees hanging on your wall than a thermometer? You think because you have millions in the bank? You think because you had, oh, I had a successful business lunch. I made $20,000 in three hours off of God's people. You think that you will escape the judgment of God? You think because you dress up in your nice, pretty stuff and you sit on the front row and they say, hey, Sister Perkins, how you doing? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. Thou shalt escape the judgment of God. You think because you sit and you can regurgitate scripture back and you can make it sound real good to argue with people that you shall escape the judgment of God. I could go on with this list all day long. How dare I sit and think just because even though I sit here before you delivering the truth that I'm going to escape the judgment of God because I will have to stand. And salvation is a solo experience. Many people have put off their surrender to Christ and have refused to obey, right? There are even some who call themselves professed Bible believing, full commandment keeping Christians, but do not live what they profess on an hourly, daily, monthly, weekly, yearly basis, right? Sad will be the day when those who profess to be Christians, those who profess to be part of the Bible believing, truth speaking Christians, right? Part of the remnant, but who do not live up to their profession, find out at the end that they are lost. Sad will be the day. Matthew 7, verses 22 and 23. Many will say to me in that day, but Lord, Lord, have I not prophesied in your name? Did I not speak in tongues for 20 hours? 
in your name? Did I not cast out devils? Did I not sell holy water to people for $3 a bottle, for $20 a bottle? Did I not sell holy water in little packets that I know I got um, from tap water in my sink and said that I went over to Israel and bought back this water in your name, Lord, to help your people, right? In your name, did I not do many wonderful works? Did I not feed people on the street and buy them some McDonald's or some Burger King, but stop to take 50 selfies as I did it and then post it on social media? Did I not do those things in your name, Lord? Did I not? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Ye that work sin. Basically what it's saying. So notice, these are people who profess to be Christians. They did many wonderful things in the name of Jesus, donated money, went out and served time, you know, prayed for a few people here and there, but they harbored iniquity and sin in their lives. Therein lies the problem, as my grandma used to say. Now is the time to put away our sins, brothers and sisters. When Jesus comes, it will be too late at that time to confess our mistakes, right? We must make our peace. We must make our peace with God today. Tomorrow may be too late, right? Do not wait for a more convenient time because we don't know. We don't know that we are uh, promised the next minute the next hour. We do not know. Why? Because he says, for I come quickly. We don't know, so do it now. And the prophet Daniel was very much interested, right, in the work of Jesus as our high priest. As the earthly sanctuary was just a copy of the sanctuary in heaven, right? And again, some of these terms, some of these things may be new for some of you that are watching right now. Right. So again, like I said, the replay will be here. Don't try and scribble things down. Come back, take your time, sit with it. Allow God to work on you. Allow him, let him use you as you go through the study. Right. So the work of the earthly priest was a representation of the work of Jesus as our high priest, our mediator in the judgment. Right. The angel told Daniel exactly when in history, right? He told him the time that this phase, last phase of Christ's work will begin. He clearly told him, Daniel 8, 14. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Just as the last work of the earthly priesthood, right? Each year was the cleansing of the sanctuary or the temple on the day of atonement, the day of at one minute, right? So the last work of Jesus as our high priest is the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. In doing this, he makes a final disposition of sin in the work of the investigative judgment. Now, there was a definite time, right? There was a specific time for the cleansing of the earthly sanctuary, the 10th day of the seventh month each year. You can find that in Leviticus 16, Leviticus chapter 16, verse 29. So we can expect that God has set a definite time for Jesus to begin his ministry, right? As our high priest in his great work of atonement for our sins in the heavenly sanctuary. What happened? God revealed to the prophet Daniel the exact time Christ will begin the last phase of his work as our high priest in the heavenly court. Jesus was to begin cleansing the heavenly sanctuary at the end of the 2300 days, right? Keeping in mind, remember, time in Bible prophecy is symbolic. Bolic, right? According to the golden key that unlocks the meaning of time in Bible prophecy, a day can equal a year. A day can equal a year. Some people say a day equals a year, but I like to say a day can equal a year, depending on which book that you're in. God says in Ezekiel 4, 6, I have appointed thee each day for a year, right? So the 2300 day prophecy in Daniel 8, 14 actually represents 2300 years. 
right? So actually, this 2300 year span is the longest time prophecy in the Bible. At first, Dan Daniel was looking at it and he was like, I don't understand what this is. He was perplexed by it, right? He didn't understand the events that were associated, what he was looking at. So he asked God for understanding. And at the close of chapter eight, he says, but none understood it. And in chapter nine, while he was praying, what did God do? He sent an angel to explain the vision to him. He begins by saying in Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So Daniel was told the first 70 weeks of the prophecy were allotted to the nation of Israel as a time of probation. Next, he was told when the prophecy would begin and the exact year that the Messiah would appear. Know therefore and understand that from going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, right? Notice this amazing prophecy actually forecast the very year that Jesus would appear as the Messiah, right? You got this? Thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Miss Bella. This amazing, if you look at it, it tells us the exact very year. So when you look at it, this prophecy, the angel told Daniel that the first 69 weeks of prophetic time are 483 literal years were to reach to Messiah the Prince. This amazing prophecy, this amazing revelation gives us the exact year in which Christ was to appear as the savior of our world. And if the Jews, if the religious leaders had only studied prophecy instead of ninging, ninging back and forth and all the other stuff that they was running around doing, if they'd only studied the prophecies of Christ's first coming, they would have clearly accepted him as their savior, right? How many professed Christians are still making the same mistake today? Not studying the wonderful prophecy that's laid out clearly before us. You just have to allow the scales to fall off to be able to clearly see how everything lines up according to the great clock of time concerning Christ's second coming. And they will also because of that, be unprepared to receive him when he returns as the King of Kings and the Lord of the Lords, right? Now, no doubt the apostle Paul knew this and he understood this, right? The 2300 day for a year prophecy, because you look in Galatians 4, 4, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son. You see, Jesus appeared right on time as he came to the Jordan River, you remember that? To be baptized by John and anointed by the Holy Spirit to begin his earthly ministry as the Messiah. So since the 2300 day prophecy was to begin in 457 BC, and since it was to be 69 prophetic weeks or 483 literal years from that date until the time the Messiah would come. Again, I know this may be a lot, Take your time, come back to the replay. Then we can know for a fact that Christ was the Messiah because he came exactly on time in the year AD 27, right? He knew exactly what time to appear. He knew that he had appeared exactly on time, right? Mark 1, Verses 14 and 15. Now, after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. This prophecy silences the infidel and baffles the Jew, right? How do we know that Jesus appeared in AD 27 to begin his ministry as the Messiah? right? If we compare the biblical record to secular history, we read in Luke um, chapter three, verses one, two, three. 
Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, the word of God came unto John and he came into all the country about Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance for the remissions of sins. Tiberius Caesar began to rule in AD 12 and Pontius Pilate began his rule in AD 27. Not only does the prophecy reveal the year of Christ's appearance as the Messiah, but it further reveals the exact year of his death. Welcome, Sister Natasha. And Daniel 9, 20, um, uh, chapter 9, verses 26 and 27. It says the Messiah will be cut off or die and not for himself, but for the people. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation offering to God. That just means offerings to God to cease, to stop. So Jesus was to be crucified in the middle of the 70th week. The last of the 70 weeks originally allocated as the probationary time to the nation of Israel, right? Friends, just as prophecy laid it out, just as the scripture tells us line upon line, precept upon precept, it happened just as it was supposed to. Exactly 69 prophetic weeks of 483 literal years after the decree to rebuild Jerusalem in 457 BC. Jesus appeared in AD 27 and exactly what? Three and a half years later, right in the middle of the 70th prophetic week, he died upon the cross of Calvary. Right on time right on time. The great clock of time continues to tick. So as I said at the very beginning of this, is he a God that he should not lie? So why should we sit here and think that what he says is to come is not coming? Not only did Jesus die in the precise year, but on the precise day, according to the symbolism of biblical prophecy, right? You see, the slaying of the Passover lamb was a symbol of Jesus, the lamb of God, which was to take away the sins of the world. And the crucifixion of Christ actually occurred at the time of the Passover. You remember this? So the prophecy was fulfilled on the exact day of its symbolic meaning in the sacrificial system. He died as the final lamb of God everything lined up. Boom, boom, bam. And good news, ain't it? While Jesus, the dear son of God, was hanging on the cross, the priest in the temple was preparing to offer the evening sacrifice. Then when Jesus died, the Bible says, look at it, Matthew 27, 51. Then Behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. We are told that this, oh my goodness, that's good news. We are told that this frightening event caused the priest to drop his knife and the sacrificial lamb got away. This indicated it was no longer necessary. Wouldn't you drop yours if you standing there and all of a sudden this huge curtain just rips in two from top to nobody. I mean, this wasn't no Dollar Tree. This wasn't no Dollar General curtain, people. This was a huge, heavy duty. Think of it. Think of the magnitude of God, right? Think of the magnitude of our Father. Think of the magnitude of his omnipresence, how big this curtain, how heavy this thing was. This wasn't something you go get from the Dollar Tree and you can just rip it in half, that this huge curtain just ripped in two from top to bottom. And you standing there and you just cut and getting ready to do the sacrifice and then stuff start quaking. Man, come on, come on. Don't even say, mm -mm. you drop it too, right? And this indicated it was no longer necessary to offer the blood of animals because the blood of Jesus had been spilt. The sacrificial system came to an end just as the prophecy of Daniel had declared. He shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. 
Again, translating that, he shall cause the sacrifice and the offerings, the lamb offerings, the sacrificial offerings to cease to stop, right? What can wash away my sins? We know able one answer to that. Then at the end of the 70th prophetic week, exactly three and a half years after the crucifixion, what happened? Stephen was stoned. The Jews were rejected as a favored nation and the gospel did what? went to the Gentiles. Therefore, the 70 weeks allotted to the people of Israel as probationary time closed with the stoning of Stephen in 34 AD. Tick tock, tick tock. The great clock of time, once again, right on time. Since then, both Jew and Gentile have an equal opportunity before God. Amen. When the 70 weeks or the 490 prophetic years were cut off from the 2300 years, what happened? That still left 1810 years. We add 1810 years to 34 AD. It brings us to 1845. Four, the date which marks the end of the 2300 year prophecy. Right on time. Set your garment by it. Tick tock, click clock. My garment must even, I have this thing set to kick on when I'm running. Got my pressure so up with this good news. This thing kicked on recording that I'm running right now. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The prophet Daniel says in Daniel 8, 14, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Christ's solemn ministry as our great high priest actually began in 1844. Don't sit there and say, well, oh, we just walked through it. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Again, get you some cold water some tea, whatever your libation of choice to be able to go back and do the math, do the dates and be like, my, my, that great clock is still right on time. That Torah ain't so crazy, right? She ain't a fanatic. Well, call it what you want, but I'm just telling you the truth. Yes, friends, brothers and sisters, the, that today, the sanctuary in heaven is the very center of Christ's work in behalf, on behalf of fallen man. So at the end of this great 2300 year prophecy in 1844, when they laughed at them too, Christ began his work as high priest in the judgment halls of heaven. The cleansing of the sanctuary represents the cleansing of the temple of God, of the sins that have been confessed by the prayers offered by God's children through all centuries of time, right? We're living in the anti-typical day of at one minute, day of atonement. And again, some of you may be saying, I have never heard, what am I preaching? What am I, hey, I can't speak for them. All I can do is speak and give the trumpet a certain sound with the words of truth and lay it out for you, clear as day, line upon line, precept upon precept, and hope that you open your heart and your mind before it's too late to receive it. This great ministry of Christ was represented on the day of atonement by the high priest who entered into the most holy place of the sanctuary once a year to cleanse it from the sins that have been confessed over the blood of animals that they were sacrificing. The cleansing of the sanctuary on the day of atonement, it was a very solemn event in the lives of the people of Israel. Why? Because it was a day of judgment. Therefore, according to this 2300 year prophecy, the cleansing of the temple of God in heaven of all the sins that have been confessed down through the ages, just time after time is going on at this present time in earth's history. The Bible says in Hebrews 9, 24, for Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true 
but into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. Praise God by virtue of the atonement of the blood of Jesus, right? The sins of all truly penitent will be blotted out in the books of heaven. That's something to shout about. That's something to say amen about, right? Think about that. Just think about it. The Bible explains the work that Christ is doing on our behalf in heaven during these last days is as follows. Hebrews 9, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Attended by heavenly angels, our great high priest appears in the presence of God to make atonement for all those who are entitled to its benefit. And who's entitled to it? All. Everybody. You just got to decide. The scripture continues the explanation of Christ's work as our mediator. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. And it is appointed for men to die once. But after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Right? You see this here. Look at it. And it is only necessary for those who seek the blessing of his grace to ask in the name of Jesus. And their sins will be covered by his blood. Right? Think of it, brothers and sisters. Christ has been doing the work of cleansing the temple in heaven for years upon years, centuries upon centuries, blotting out sins that have been confessed in his name. However, in some cases, he's blotting out names also from the book of life, right? Of those who have failed to confess their sins and to live a true life. Christian, God-centered life. That's a sad, sad thing. It's a sad thing. And I sit sometimes and I tell people, because y'all know, I keep me a prayer log here. And I write down the dates and everything in here. So I'm able to go back and I follow up with people, you know, and I kind of, you know, jokingly tell people, don't worry about it. I'm not going to blot your name out of my prayer book. That's not my job. But there is somebody that's blotting out names. Amen. God is seated on his throne. Jesus is there as our great intercessors and the angels are there. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands. My God, the books have been opened and the records are being reviewed, right? God has books wherein the records are kept. He has the book of life in which are entered the names of those who claim to be his followers because he knows, right? Revelations 20 and 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were were written in the book. This makes it plain, clear, simple, and plain that only those names that are in the book of life, those who have been professed Christians will be judged at this time. In addition to the book of life, we're told that God has a book of iniquity, right? All of our sins are recorded in this book. Amen, Sister Missy Bella. I will add you to the book, my sister. All of our sins are recorded in this book. Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 22. For thou, you, for though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, yet your iniquity, oh my goodness, yet your iniquity is marked before me, says the Lord God. So you can go out and you can try and soap it all up. You can wash it off. You can put brute. You can put whatever you want to try and put on it. Old spice to cover up the smell and stank of sin. But what does he tell you right here? You can use much soap, yet your iniquity is marked before me. And you say, oh, that's good news to me. Vengeance is mine, 
saith the Lord. The angels have a complete record of all of our transgression and they are marked in heaven's record book. The names and deeds of all men are recorded here. So those people that are sitting weeping with tears come and saying, why wasn't my son, my daughter, my mothers, my husbands, my brothers, my cousins murderer brought, um, brought up? It's okay. Why? Because the good news tells us it's all right there in the book, right? It's all right there. And the books will be open for all to see. So they can see that God is a God of justice, that he is a God of truth, right? That he's not those things. It's going to be open for all to see that Satan truly, the devil was alive, right? That is the reason that it will be open. All of these names, all of these deeds are recorded there. And there is a record to determine the final decisions in God. God's great judgment, right? There's also a third book. Y'all know about the third one? It's sometimes called the book of remembrance. It contains a record of all the good things we say and all the good things that we do. Malachi 3.16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke one to another and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. You remember what saved Mordecai? What saved him? The book of remembrance. When he was sitting up and going through and they were like, wait a minute minute. Hey, you know Mordecai did this for you? Hey, King, did you know? Well, what shall I do for old Mordecai? Well, you know what? You should put him on your best donkey and you should give him that. You know, that whole thing didn't work out so well for Haman, right? But that's a whole nother teaching, right? So I hope and pray that God has a long list of good things under my name in the book of remembrance. I pray that God has a long list of good things that under your name in that book of remembrance. Lord, 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 Lord. Mm, mm, mm. Think about it. Every idle act, every idle word is going in one of these three books. You decide, right? We can clearly see the book of life, the book of sin and the book of a uh, book of remembrance. If you are a follower of his, a true follower, your name is in the book of life. Your sins are recorded in the book of iniquity and your good deeds in the book of remembrance. If you have confessed all of your sins that are listed in the book of iniquity, what happens? They are blotted out by the blood of Jesus to be remembered no more. And your name will be retained in the book of life. And again, this is not to scare you because it would be a miss to me. It would be wrong of me to sit here with these truths, with this knowledge and not be able to tell you and give you a chance for you to be like, wait a minute, let me go back and try and prove Torah wrong. Well, you can't prove God wrong because his word says it, it says it right there in the book. Right. However, if there are unconfessed sins, sins that you have failed to forsake, then when your name is called in the judgment, your name will be blotted out. Boop, boop, boop. It tells us Revelation 3, 5, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. Clearly. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out of his name out of the book of life. It says it right there. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Every name is mentioned. Every case closely investigated. Men on earth may miss a few clues. They might not find everything that they need to find to handle these cases properly. But rest assured, brothers and sisters, every case will be closely investigated. Vengeance is mine said the Lord. Names are accepted and rejected according to the records of these great books. And you ask by what standard will I be judged? Well, Ecclesiastes 12, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Notice that the commandments of God will be the standard by which we will be judged. It is the only standard that God has ever given us. No wonder Satan is determined to make man just break one. All you need to do is just break one of God's commandment, for he knows that if he succeeds, it will condemn 
each and every one of us in the judgment. Remember, all heaven is interested in the fate of each name and all heaven is at your side to help us be able to gain the victory in this war. God says if we break one of the least of his commandments, we will be found guilty of what? Guilty of all. James chapter 2, 10 and 12. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not, do not commit adultery, and also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak, and so do all those. So speak, and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. So you can see that we're going to be judged by the law. It says, do not commit adultery. Also said, do not commit murder. John 4, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Do we love Jesus enough to obey him? What does scripture tell us? There's only one way to the father and that's through him. The answer to the question will determine whether or not our names will be retained in the Lamb's book of life. Sober in thought, brothers and sisters, let us show our love by keeping all of his commandments and overcoming every temptation with his help. The Bible, as we bring it to a close in Acts 3, 19, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When your name is called in the great Supreme Court of the universe of heaven, will Jesus stand before the father and plead your case? Will that be the case? No matter how many sins you may have committed, if you have confessed them in his name, he will plead for you, right? On the other hand, if you willfully, because right, it's free will. He gives you a choice. He doesn't make, he doesn't drag you. He just stands there, knocks. It's up to you to open the door. If you willfully persist in known sins, the blood of Jesus can never and will never cover such disobedience. If you know that you have unconfessed sins on God's record book, you cannot eradicate them in any way except if they are covered by the blood of Jesus. If you fail to claim his shed blood, Christ will have to remain silent when your name is called. You know the song when the roll is called up y'all. Y'all know that song. So when the roll call, silence. Man, think about it. Think of just think about these things in your quiet time. He will not be able to stand and plead your case. Christ is our heavenly mediator. He is the only one that can help us. There is no attorney that you can go out and hire. It doesn't matter. Mm -mm. If the glove fit, mm -mm. what does it say? If the glove fit, if the glove don't fit, you must have quit. That ain't going to work in this case. There is no attorney that you can go hire. There is no amount of money that you can pay. There are no amount of works that you can go out and perform. There is nothing that you can do. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. There's nothing that you can do. There's no monkey show. There's no act. There's no circus you can perform in, right? There is nothing that you can do to gain salvation. The only one who can successfully plead for us is Jesus. You, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, it says it right there. And he can only plead for us if our sins are confessed and allowed to be put away, to be blotted out, to be put in the deep abyss of the ocean, never to be brought back again, even though man will try and throw them back. So let us now, at this time, as the great clock of time continues to tick, 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 tick. And as we laid out through the prophetic timeline, how everything has happened on time. So why do you think he would be a God that he should lie at the end, right? How many of you today will accept him as your savior so that he may be your high priest and plead his blood, his atoning death as the payment for your sins on that great judgment day? How important is it to be ready? When a warning, right? When is a warning a good thing, right? A warning's not a good thing when 
Oh, let me warn y'all. Uh, like after what was that? Uh, Hurricane Harvey when it came through here. Now if they told us after the city was under 30 feet of water in some place that wouldn't have done us no good but they started warning us before right so when is a warning a good thing right after the event happens or before the question is if christ would appear this day would you be ready to meet him in peace better yet it's a clear sign right as I said at the beginning, the evidence is all around us that Christ is coming, that is soon to come, even at the door, right? And again, we went back through where, uh, remember the apostle Peter wrote concerning this, where's the promise of his coming? A lot of people say that, well, they've been saying that he was coming back since this, this. look at the great clock of time. Quit listening to what Pookie them now said. Look at the great clock of time, how everything has happened on time, right? And you, when you say, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers have fallen asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Second Peter 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 4. But now you see the day of the Lord hastens and it's even at the door. As I sit and watch the floods, you got civil war going on in countries. You got earthquake after earthquake and they're coming faster. They're coming harder. Just the beginning of the pains, people, I'm telling you, are you going to be ready when this storm hits, right? But better yet, do you desire to prepare yourself for this climactic appearing of the Lord? Because it won't be anything silent. It won't be anything that we won't know about because he says, hey, I'm coming with the quickness and I'm coming with my reward in my hand. Let us pray, fathers, uh, brothers and sisters. Lord, we thank you for the blessing of the reading and studying of your word today. We ask that these words of life and truth and hope will continue to impact us in the weeds, stakes, and months if you allow us them ahead. May your love and grace, Father, follow each of us as we turn to our daily lives. We're Flesh, refreshed and blessed by you, Lord. We pray for all the words that you have sown into our hearts today. We ask that you watch over and protect them, and may they take root and produce wonderful things, things of beauty, and be a great blessing to many, Lord. Until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand, brothers and sisters. And we ask all of this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. And I hope you've heard something today that maybe make you say, hmm, I'm going to have to go back and look over this again. Because I think the clock is to wait a minute. Hmm. I may have heard something about this before and I understand it a little bit better and I need to lower a little bit more. Hey, just reach out. We'll be more than glad to sit down and go through it with you. You know, you say, well, you know what? I kind of want to look at this. I want to look at these slides. I want to look through this. I'll be glad to send you some more information to be able to send you more scriptural context. And, and maybe even if time allows to sit down and go through a study, which I would be more than happy to do that. Until next time, brothers and sisters, walk good, do good, be good. And remember, God loves you, loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son, right, on our behalf to say, go take the sin away from the raggedy people, even though they don't deserve it. He gave his one and only begotten son. So the least that we can do is just to give him a little bit of our time each day and get to know him, spend time in prayer and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior before it's too late, before that final trumpet sounds. I love you, but most importantly, God loves you more. Jesus loves you, brothers and sisters. Until next time, walk good, do good, be good. Tornado, I'm out.